Dan Holden is director of Arbor Network's ACERT. Welcome, Dan. Thank you for having me. So we're at yet another uh, high watermark, I think, in the security industry. There feels like a buzz in the entire industry, mostly sparked by uh, Mandiant's uh, report now. So Mandiant reports on APT1, uh, claimed uh, cyber espionage unit in China. What's your general take on the Mandiant report? Um, well, I'd have to say, uh, um, I would have to say regardless of my take or anyone else's take, what, what I do like is the fact that they shared a good portion of their um, intelligence or research. I, I think just from a research um, sharing standpoint, it, it was well done, right? If you if you share indicators and anything of, of how you came to a particular conclusion, and if you can share that with the rest of the industry to corroborate or or debate, which is fine, or you know agree, which is also fine. Um, I just think that's I think that's a fantastic thing. I think that's the way you you do research, and um, this is obviously a very collaborative you know industry I think we're in um, and it I think everybody's come to the conclusion especially over the last three years with so much uh, geopolitical association with with the security industry that no one particular vendor or you know company or, or even government unit anyone you know no no one knows it all um, and I actually heard that on a panel at RSA years ago you know that's no one knows it all and, and anytime you share that level of information uh, I think it not only makes that you know report stand up better but I think it allows everyone else to continue the research which I think is the most important part and um, I think I think the last three years have been huge actually you know I think Google deserves a lot of credit when they came out with of course the the you know sharing information around yeah, Aurora right I mean that's that's kind of what sparked it all you know historically we've always talked about you know breaches and um, you know, unless unless somebody was, you know, a website was getting defaced or there was a DDoS event, right? Your visibility into someone being attacked was quite minimal many times. Um, Arbor's had a lot of good research reports, especially on DDoS, but what's your role now at Arbor? Uh, director of uh, ACERT, which is our security uh, R&D organization. Um, and we've, uh, we've got a lot of research that historically is centered around botnets and DDoS, but um, uh, are, are recently uh, really delving farther into the other uh, families and, and aspects of malware, if you will. So the Manuet report and, of course, anything associated with uh, targeted attacks is, is very much up our alley these days. We've spent a lot of effort on, on banking Trojans, obviously, especially with the uh, recent DDoS events in the banking industry, uh, lots of customers in that vertical. And so um, we're trying to really not just help with visibility into to DDoS and botnets, uh, but also, you know, any of the other uh, advanced type malware that, that might be targeting um, banks or their customers. How do you get your visibility into those attacks? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, either from uh, customers or customers of customers. So in, in Arbor's case, it's, it's actually quite interesting because we have a, a large customer base of, of ISPs, um, which is our, our historical customer base. And uh, a lot of hosting providers, a lot of enterprises, uh, and so it, it, because a lot of the hosting providers and, and ISPs are, are so fundamental now to um, you know modern networking, you know cloud computing, et cetera, et cetera, right, the, the customers are, are more tied together than they used to be, and more dependent on each other than they used to be. Um, so we're having a really good time and, and are in a, a fairly unique position that we're kind of the, the middleman, if you will, between those two worlds. Uh, yeah, you, and you it, kind and of it, have sensors on all uh, those absolutely, big networks, yeah, right? Absolutely, and, and because of that, it, it allows us some, some fantastic information. So I, I found in, in this industry, of course, generally many times you know what you know because of your customers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's that's pretty foundational to, to our, our, our industry. and so. In our case, because we've got the ISPs as, as our historical customer base, we've got a much larger and broader view into the, the Internet's troubles, if you will, than if you were a, a pure enterprise-based uh, vendor. So uh, I can say I've certainly been enjoying that, that view into the, the larger Internet. Yeah. You, you think Data. you know networking in, until you start working with ISPs, and then you really learn networking yeah. is, what yeah. I, <laughs> is what I found. Um, let's delve into the DDoS um, issue, mm -hmm. and especially you know fall of 2012 into 2013, there are all these you know Iranian-associated attacks against U.S. banking infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Walk us through the whole thing because it's a big story. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and I think 
I think part of the reason why it is such a big story, of course, is that it was so visible. Mm -hmm. right? um, I, I always joke, you know, everyone from you know the janitor to the CEO knows when you're you're getting DDoS, right? And and of course, including your customers and the rest of the world. So it is a much more public event generally than than a lot of you know say any kind of targeted type of attack. Um, and so the visibility is there, obviously, given the uh, level of advertisement, if you will, uh, that's occurred on, on Pacebin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fact that they advertise the attacks when they're coming, who's going to be targeted. Um, yeah, it's kind of the Babe Ruth attack, you know. Yeah. <laughs> We're going after you, and sure enough, they go down. So that's been right. a little bit of a frustration from people on the outside, me in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, the bank has gotten, you know, four days warning that this is coming, and they still go down. It's, don't they have the right technology? Well, it's interesting. Um, certainly, when they first hit, um, you know, I, I think everyone was kind of caught off off guard, and of course, over time, everyone has, has gotten much better at the defense. What, what's interesting about these attacks is it's almost a, uh, and, and we've kind of been seeing this in other areas of the industry. It's almost a, a, a flashback back to the future type mm -hmm. of event, right? So, you know, if you look at uh, at the the nineties, um, you know, you and I didn't have incredible bandwidth. Right mm -hmm. d during those years, um, you know, if you had ISDN, you were flying. So, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what happened, of course, if you wanted to DOS someone, you, you generally ended up, you know, owning a system that that was attached to big bandwidth. Um, at, at that point, universities were pretty easy to pick on, and mm -hmm. right. And so, you know, if you wanted to knock somebody off of IRC, for instance, which was a pretty popular use case back then, right? You would you would uh, own a system and, and ping dash f, and there you go. Yep. Um, and so, these attacks are almost a, a flashback to that because, of course, they're going after very high bandwidth systems that are, are you know hosting or, or you know websites. You know, in this case, a lot of WordPress and, and Joomla being targets. Um, and of course, a much smaller botnet. And so, what I think has occurred is, you know, you get to you know 2010, and you've got anonymous, which kind of redefines DDoS. And this, I think, is another fundamental shift uh, in DDoS, where they've kind of redefined and, and helped essentially lay a, a groundwork that others could follow. So that's the interesting part. It's not even necessarily who's behind it or how they're doing it. What what they've now done is essentially given a new and different blueprint. For how it can be done, mm -hmm. um, and so that's a that's a bit scary as well. Um, I would say what really sets this apart, of course, is the focus. So uh, you know, again, regardless of who's doing it, I, I would say there's got to be some level of funding behind it because it would be very difficult for pure hacktivists to likely stick together for that extended amount of time mm. and and continue to be that focused without without someone. Um, Continuing that focus, you know, kind of uh, behind them, if you will. So, that that I, I think that kind of stands out as well. So, what are the banks that were targeted and you know uh, came back up afterwards? What are they doing now that's different from six months ago? It's an excellent question. It's not just the banks, and, and that's what I think folks have got to understand. As I mentioned earlier, right, the the enterprise is so much more dependent on their hosting and and service providers. Um, you know, so you know, the, in many cases, your network is is the internet. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. right? yeah, so you're on it. I mean, you know, you, many you, you don't even have visibility into your own email in many cases, right? Mm -hmm. and so many of your services are, are outsourced, um, and uh, in many cases, of course, your DDoS defense is outsourced. So I think what has what these particular attacks and the focus of these attacks has highlighted to the the banks and all involved were that you couldn't just rely on, on a pure cloud or a service pr provider play because um, what it was occurring with these attacks is it wasn't just what people typically think of DDoS as, you know, a, a, a fundamental plumbing problem, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of network and, you know, the smaller the pipe gets and, and down you go. They, they were absolutely doing that and they were doing that multi-vector, different protocols, different tool sets, um, and then almost using that to measure what the provider and enterprise could defend against. And then while that's occurring, crawling, taking a look, investigating the website, and then going after the application. And I think that was the big lesson learned, um, both at the provider level, which ag again is, is the partner of the banks. And uh, so I think one of the things that's happened is they have figured out that relationship better. Um, and uh, you know, learned how to work together and exchange information, which of course is critical to any defense, regardless of DDoS or otherwise. Um, and then also looked at the fact that you know the application level threat uh, is more of a 
it, it many times requires more of an on-premise defense, and of course, hardening those applications, changing those applications. Um, we all know, you know, web application security is an incredibly difficult and mm -hmm. <laughs> daunting mm -hmm. task that's been, you know, we've been dealing with for well over a decade. Um, and I, that was a big part of this, I think, realizing that it's not just the network. It, so yep. just being on a content delivery network or Cloudflare, mm -hmm. like where my websites are, isn't enough because they figure out, you know, at some point right. the cloud's got to connect to your server yeah. and if, do something. If, if what's getting DDoSed is the login to your web page, uh -huh. right, that yeah. doesn't necessarily require a ton of traffic to do. Yeah, I'll say. And so that, I think that's that's the difficult part about DDoS is because because it is a term and a problem that we have been kind of used to and and you know knowledge going back to you know the the late 90s uh, people have assum certain assumptions about it you know you, you think of mafia boy and and sin floods and mm -hmm. and it's so far past that and i think it's just i think it's a reflection of the industry in general especially over the last 3 years so much has changed over the last 3 years and DDoS is right there with it. And it's amazing, actually, to me that it's taken this long for DDoS to mature. You know, if you look at something like SQL injection, you know, we, we start learning about that in late 1998. We get to 2008, and it's finally used on a really grand scale. You know, people are using it for drive-by and botnet growth and all sorts of amazing things. Right? I mean, that took a while to mature. DDoS, you would have thought, kind of had its run, mm -hmm. and it's come back and mature, it keeps, continues to mature, right? And the use cases for it are, are outrageous. They just keep changing, right? And so like I said, the um, anonymous, you know, found new ways to use it, uh, is arguing that it's uh, a, a uh, you know, freedom of speech. Right, yep. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a form of protest. Um, some, and then, and and some countries are trying to legalize it as right, freedom of speech. Right, right. Yeah. And then you've also, of course, got, uh, you know, you certainly have aspects of it uh, that could be used in cyber warfare. Uh, you've got competitive takeout, um, which is, uh, I think, a, an example and a use case that many people aren't aware of, uh, but certainly happens um, in, in other geographies, certainly in, in uh, Asia, uh, being uh, pretty popular there. Um, so there's just a lot of different ways to use DDoS, I think. And, and that's one of the things that makes it so popular, I think, is all of the various use cases. And then, of course, all the various types and so I think that's one of the things that, that continues, how, how it continues to evolve and why it's so popular and growing. Is there a, a, you know, a solution or a reaction that Arbor can help somebody with when you know, they, they go, hey, I'm under DDoS, I never thought about this before, how do we get back? Assumably they call the DDoS experts. Um, you know, where do you start? You know, does, Arbor, <laughs> does Arbor help by calling the ISP for them? Oh, well, you know, there's a lot of different things. Um, Certainly, uh, you know, again, we've got customers that, that kind of run the gambit, so from provider to, to hosting provider to, to enterprise. We've got both um, solutions that we, we provide to both the, the ISP level and, and really large enterprises, and then, um, you know, down to the, the on-premise and, and kind of whatever bandwidth or size you need to, to defend against, um, which is important, right? Because, you know, defending, an, defending against an attack at the ISP level and defending against the attack, you know, at the the enterprise level are, are could, c can be potentially quite different. Um, and so uh, certainly you're defending different uh, different networks and different sizes, right? So yeah, a lot, there's, there's a, a lot of possibility there. Uh, that's the good part, I would say, about DDoS defense. Um, unlike some other aspects of, of security is you, you can fit it, I think, to, to the needs and, and grow it over time, which is, um, which is difficult in many other aspects of security. One thing we haven't seen much of, the threat is there, and that's the, the competitive DDoS. And, you know, we always talk, in, you know, 20 years ago, we thought as e-commerce systems came online, that people would be taking pot shots. And it's always been <laughs> amazing to me that, that pretty much they don't. Is mm -hmm. that still true? Well, you know, and, and it seems in the Western world, yeah, uh, it, it doesn't. Because um, it's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and as we were saying earlier, you know, DDoS is quite visible. Mm, so yeah. everyone knows you know, when it's, when it's happening. Um, it, it does qu happen quite a bit in uh, the East, though. Certainly in Asia, uh, you see it far more often. And what's interesting, and I, I don't know if you saw this, but um, it was, of course, so many of what's happened over the last few years is, is the com commercialization of uh, so many um, bad aspects right, to, mm -hmm. to security, right? Um, you know, you can rent or lease anything, you know, whether it's malware or a botnet. 
Um, and of course, there's commercial DDoS services. And um, one of the best examples of this, and it's very popular on a lot of the forums, you know, and they went, of course, from uh, advertising botnet size, uh, and you know, it costs this much to now it costs, you know, uh, very, very little, um, you know, a couple bucks an hour. And uh, and now they don't longer, you know, compete on, on numbers or size; they compete on levels of service. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's uh, you know can customize the attack for you, you know. 24 by 7, uh, you know, support, um, you know, uh, accepts Bitcoin, you know. <laughs> so it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's matured quite quickly. And one of my absolute favorite and uh, fairly well known in the industry was the, uh, the Guapo commercials. Um, and so uh, this, this character named Guapo had uh, a, a few um, essentially YouTube commercials advertising his DDoS service. And uh, the la I think there were about three. And the last one to hit was highly polished. And he had a website. Um, and it was, uh, much of it was based on competitive takeout. That was essentially the commercial, was we can take out your competitor for you. So oh. you know, out of all the use cases to advertise the service on, that was the one they chose. Interesting <laughs> times ahead. <I> <laughs> Certainly, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dan Holden from Arbor Networks. Appreciate it. Thank you.